Paul, welcome back to the internet. Oh, it's so good to be back on the internet. Right, people are so friendly and honest, and there's no stress here, and everybody's happy. <laughs> yes, yes, that's true. So, everything went okay and you were now at your new home, yes? Uh, yeah, kind of. I'm staying at, um, I'm staying with some family right now, in the basement, actually. And actually, all of the kids are here in the room with me, so if you hear, like, some coughing in the background or silent, you know, like, quiet weeping, that's, that's just them. Oh, it doesn't matter when kids cry. Who cares? Well, I'm glad that worked out for you and you're back. Yeah, yeah. We, we were hoping to have internet, like, when we got here. Um, you know, bought our own cable modem so we could just hook it up. But no, they had to, like, do their crazy voodoo magic or something on the cables. I don't know what. Right, they always want to come out in your house and breathe all over the place and hook up stuff. Stand there for 20 minutes, hooked up to your modem, just looking at it blink with some weird device I guess. in their hand. You know, I've always wondered, like, what are you doing? Why is this taking so long? I, you're up. I'm connected now. Why don't you just get out of my house and let me begin interneting? <laughs> right. We um we had all the times we moved somewhere before we had um fiber fiber internet and also oh, the this internet is me was envious. Oh, yeah, I know, right? It's so good. We got it so good here on the west coast. Uh, so it it had been hooked up before. You know, we didn't have to do the first time connection where they'd run the line from the pole to your house and like run the thing through your attic or whatever. It just it had been connected before. So all they needed to do was just hook it up and. Uh, a few times they're like, no, we got to send a tech out. But one time I managed to convince the person on the phone to just let me do it. I'm like, look, I know how to do this. I can connect the cat cable from the modem up to my router. And, and like, this isn't a problem. Don't worry about it. And they're like, are you sure? I'm like, yes. Okay. Well, you know, go outside and see if the light's blinking. Yes, the light's blinking. Okay. Well, I guess you have internet now. All right. Thanks. <laughs> Good job, everybody. <laughs> right. They do that here too. Um, they're like, oh, we'll, we'll connect it to your computer. And I'm like, no, you'll connect it to my router. And I want, I don't right. want you touching anything beyond that. I've, I know what I'm doing. Uh, when we rented our house out one time, we had, we had fiber internet and then the renters got cable internet. And so when we got back, we were like, oh, we want to, you know, hook up the fiber internet again. But the cable guy had cut all the hard lines that I had installed. <laughs> So, <gasps> how evil! So I think maybe that's why they want to come out to your house, just so they can make sure that nobody else's equipment survives. It'd be like, a cable guy comes to install the internet, and while you're not looking, he cuts all your phone lines. <laughs> oh, that'll keep you from going back to dial up. Ugh, I know. It's so it's just so dumb. I actually called the cable company. I'm like, oh. We'll we'll have a technician come out and repair that. And I was like, no, I I've already fixed it. Like, there's nothing left to repair. I I'm just I'm just angry with you. <laughs> like, you can't fix this. <laughs> you can't win back my love. It's too late. Yeah. So, um, just before we were talking about the show, we got talking about old old 90s applications and um, then we decided oh this would we should save this for the show yeah yeah we were just talking about like how it used to be you could get skins for things and then people would make these skins that had like just the worst UX with like oh, weird icons worst. and like it's incomprehensible user interface or like all the buttons were in a weird place and they all look different and like couldn't you figure out how to use it Right, the worst offender for me was Winamp. It really whips the llama's ass. Um, <laughs> people older oh, than man. people older than twenty will remember that. Um, yeah, so many of the skins they did the thing where the the interface is not a box. It's like you know, 
like an oval instead, which just means you don't know where to grab onto it. <laughs> right. Like you don't you don't have a bar at the top to grab onto or minimize. You've got to figure out which one of these indecipherable icons could possibly be minimized. Yeah, it turns into some sort of cyber lozenge on your desktop, and you're like, it, is this behind all the other windows? What? How did you do that? And figuring out the interface was kind of like playing Myst, where you've got this incomprehensible machine <laughs> built by an <laughs> obstructionist idiot. Like, oh, minimize the minus sign. There it is. And it just turns the volume down. Right. So you, so you think, well... I better turn it back up. I'll hit the plus sign and it opens up add to playlist window. Right. Oh, man. Oh, I don't yet, miss it. But yet, I, so I always kept Winamp on the default skin and every once in a while, well, well, I'll give that another go. This one looks cool. And then it's like after five minutes of anti-usability, I'm like, nope, back to the back to the box, back to the rectangle. But Winamp itself, I still miss. It was a great MP play, MP3 player. And then who who bought it? Was it AOL? Uh, wasn't it um, with, with the, the music, the free music sharing Napster? Didn't Napster buy Winamp or something? You know, I'm at the Winamp homepage, and they're still doing "Whip the Llama's Ass." That joke is a quarter century old or the catchphrase a quarter of a century it's a meme that's from a quarter of a century ago and everybody forgot about it except this one company and you know what there is nothing else. I remember for years Winamp was like branded with whatever company had bought it like some older media company or something that's now like all but vanished and that that's all gone. Winamp.com is just Winamp. And there's nothing about any owning company. Huh. That's that's crazy. All right. And yeah, now it's all VLC. Right. Which probably you can get skins for. Actually for me, my my player of choice these days is Fubar. Um and hmm. I I really do like it. It's it's Simple interface, but lots and lots of windows you can enable or disable. So like if you like watching the Spectre graph, you can do that. If you want to put your MP3 in a background and you don't care what the interface looks like, you can just turn on some super minimalist thing. Oh, cool. I'll have to look it up. But can you check the mailbags on it? No, we're going to have to do that manually. They haven't made software that will check our mailbags for us and answer them. All right. So here's our first email. And I forgot to... Th this is too long to read the whole thing. Okay, but I only need to read a little bit of it. Dear DieCast, I hope you're all doing well. I just stumbled on upon a... 2015 GDC talk called Don't Call Them Whales, Free-to-Play Spenders and Virtual Value. And there's a YouTube link here. And that'll be in the show notes for those of you that are curious. There's more to this email, which you can also read in the show notes, but I'm going to jump to the end. Keep being awesome, Lino. So did you watch this, Paul? I watched uh, parts of it. He highlights two or three sections that he was particularly interested in, in us discussing and I, I watched those parts uh, and then I also kind of skipped through and, and watched a few sections here and there. You did better than me. I was immediately irritated by this woman. Like everything she said was, in, I just wanted to argue with it. Like it <laughs> felt like, like when you know a politician comes out and does that pretending to apologize but not apologizing and sort of admitting that mistakes were made but not owning up to the fact that the mistakes were their fault and then maybe minimizing all the suffering their bad decision has made and then they wander off 
that's what you know and you get angry at the politics that's what this felt like to me it's somebody yeah yeah just sort of, every ea press conference basically right just no concept of how offensive this particular message is to me and so i i did not make it very far but before i had to turn it off share with us if if you like share with us your thoughts because my thought is just anger yeah, so, I mean, first off, yes, I agree with both you and Lino that um, I, my feelings are similar toward the presenter. I did think she had a, a good point that uh, a lot of people spend a lot of money on their hobbies and that if you can consider video games a hobby, then having someone spend a thousand, five thousand, even ten thousand dollars on a video game, you know, comparable to other hobbies might not be unreasonable. And so you shouldn't feel bad about it because like, you know, people spend a lot of money on their hobbies and if they want to spend their money there instead of, you know, on her example is ice skating, but you know, whatever. Sure. Then, uh, sure. That's or like, their choice. yeah, right. The one, I don't know why she picked ice skating. That's not that expensive. I mean, there are much more expensive hobbies. Getting well, up into the she mountains. She picked it because she does ice skating. And so she was able to, oh, I missed she that. did this funny yeah. thing where it's like this funny, like, uh, Here's an example, like one of our biggest spenders in our game and like they spent this much and this much on all these things and then, oh, actually it's me and instead of the game, it was actually ice skating and here's how these costs break down. And, you know, I go to rinks and I get private lessons and all these things and I end up spending about this much a year. And uh, it was kind of this thing of like, oh, you thought it was a lot of money, but when it turns out it's ice skating, then it's not that big of a deal. I was like, okay, fair enough. Like. People are free to spend their money however they want, and if you don't have a lot of expenses, and you know, you can spend your money on expensive hobbies. Right, but for me, my impression of that argument is, um, you go, you see an ice skating rink, and it says free skating, and then you get in there, and that, and they want you to rent skates for fifty dollars an hour, and then you know, you get some skates. But they don't come with laces. That'll be another 20 bucks for, for laces. Then you get down to the ice and you realize the free skating area is three square feet where you just scoot back and forth. And to get on the big rink and actually go in a circle, you, you need to pay money. And, never, and to, in order to stop the horrendous ear-shattering klaxon that plays continuously, you need to pay another 20 bucks. Yeah, well, and, and that's the thing is like real goods and virtual goods are not the same thing. Like, and, and it's 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 a fair comparison to say that people spend a lot of money on their hobbies, and like I'm with her that far. But sure. like, you can have a a real good that like it costs money to have a skating rink, and like costs money to keep the ice cold, and cost money to have a person there doing personal instruction like all those things cost cost money to do and so there's value in them because you couldn't just get them they, they don't already exist and and are there for the taking whereas with virtual goods they really are essentially zero marginal costs like it wouldn't cost the company anything to give everyone a hundred billion gold in diablo 2 or something right like <laughs> it, it wouldn't right. it wouldn't cost them anything it's not like that's a hard thing for them to do so all of the and we're going to get into economics and stuff and like artificial scarcity but like the comparison is fair in that the budget numbers are like okay well you could expect your high paying players to pay some tens of thousands of dollars a year or something. Uh, but like the reason they're paying it is more like the reason that people spend that much at a casino than that people spend that much yeah. playing softball. The up, the upfront cost, the total cost is invisible when you walk in the door, you know, they, they don't, you don't know how much you're going to be, sp you can get a sense of how much ice skating is going to cost you and you can, extrapolate that based on your knowledge of how physics works and you know what's involved in ice skating well you need skates and ice but you don't know how right. much a game is going to try to extract from you yeah she also 
uh, admits to making up a lot of the numbers, so she puts a bunch of numbers up on the screen as examples, but then she's like, now I made these numbers up, but they're just based on my intuition of, like, <laughs> how this thing works. And, like, props for, for letting us know that you made them up, but, like, why did you go through the trouble of putting these numbers on the screen when they're all fictitious? Um, which, maybe she's drinking some of her own Kool-Aid in the whole, like, blurring the distinction between real and virtual goods kind of thing there. Um, right. There's also this weird thing where she talks about it, and Lino asks about at the end of the at the end of the episode. She talks about how games aren't respected as much as classical arts or things like that, and that it seems like they should be. And so I'm not sure how that all ties in to <laughs> why people should be paying a lot of money for video games. Right. Wait, some people, um, yeah, yet she's contributing to this idea that games are not art. P art does not have you pay by the minute. <laughs> well, right. I mean, like, you do have to pay an artist by the minute or, you know, by right. the hour or whatever. Um, but it seems like if you were going to say that art, that the games were more like the arts, then you should have, like, a patron of a video game that like pays for the development and then releases it for free so everyone can enjoy it and appreciate it and like experience it so i don't know i would be totally on board for that kind of model um instead of free to play and then you know pay to not be harassed right um, but that's not what she's trying to sell here either but it, it does it, it sparked an interesting thought in my mind at least i thought it was interesting how games are something that people do Whereas literature and art are something that is a record of something that someone experienced. And up until we had computers, it was very difficult to codify the whole setting in which you could play a game. Uh, whereas it was much easier to write down a whole story or to, to paint a picture of a whole landscape or something like that. Like it was possible to make a record of something and so therefore it was possible to study it so to say that oh well like games aren't respected like they should be because we haven't been studying them in the act the academy for very long isn't really being fair to the problem that we haven't been right. able to entirely codify games for very long so it's not like we were neglecting them on purpose it's just that like you couldn't have blind man's bluff be a thing that you study in a university you can how do you encode that Right. Also, it's ironic that she argues for treating games as art when I know from experience mobile games are some of the least artistic games out there. It's a horrible, gaudy, just awful music, awful visuals. They're all just ripping each other off. Like, it is the minimum creativity. <laughs> it's, yeah. like, it, it's like saying people don't it's like somebody who makes really, really trashy, home ha homemade, camcorder-driven pornography, complaining, why doesn't anybody respect cinema? <laughs> right? They've only had it in university for 200 years. This is outrageous. So I also didn't very much appreciate how she presented her topic, but... The part that I did appreciate was that she was saying, hey, look, these are adults making adult decisions. They can decide how to spend their money. If they've got $5,000, $6,000 lying around to spend on something, you should let them spend it on your video game because maybe you won't go broke. And like, fair enough. Like, you got to make your money somehow. Sure, I can respect that in the same way that a casino um, might say that. Like, yeah. okay, I still... I still think this is pretty trashy, but yeah, people have a right to to enjoy their trashy hobbies. If I'm, I'm not calling everybody that goes to a casino trashy, but you know, there there is that. It's not high art. Yeah. Dear Diecast, cats or dogs? For me, I am dangerously allergic to all furry animals, so I cannot own either. Um... I am more allergic to cats. Oh my goodness. It doesn't take much time around a cat to get very sick. And that sickness can linger for a day or it depends on how long I've been breathing cat dander. It, 
it can it can last for days sometimes. Um, mm -hmm. On the other hand, I do appreciate that cats need less care. Like a dog, you absolutely 100% need to walk your dog every day. Or you're going to have to walk around your house with a pooper scooper. Um, where cats pretty much see to their own business. You just change the litter box every however long those get changed. However, of both the animals, I love German Shepherds. They are the most beautiful animals. I just love a good German Shepherd. I like smart, friendly dogs. So I don't know which I'd choose if my allergies weren't a thing. I'm I'm more qualified. I'm too forgetful to give a dog the attention it deserves, but I prefer the personality of dogs. I also prefer dogs. Uh, it, it always feels like a cat is like looking for the angle where it gets to eat you. And the dog right. is like looking for the angle where you can both eat something together. And like, I'm on right. board with that. The cat often can see, it depends on the personality of the cat, but you know, sometimes they often seem indifferent to you where dogs are always happy to see you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Dear Diecast, I think Derek mentioned Gothic obscure outside of Central Europe, it seems, as an example of an RPG that was very important to him. That made me wonder, do you have games that were seminal or influenced your tastes, but might be lesser known outside of hardcore fans of certain genres? And what stood out to you about them? Kind regards from wintry Austria, Coleus Radis. So, you have an answer ready, Paul? Yeah, I don't know how how lesser known these are, but um, when I was growing up, I really liked The Incredible Machine. I think I beat the whole thing like maybe two or three times. And uh, oh, yeah. it just had this great, like, you know, fiddly pieces of machinery doing things and a bit of physics sim in there. Not too much. Um, I also liked Lemmings, kind of a similar game, like a pixel arty kind of puzzle game. Um, so... The Incredible Machine and Lemmings were, were two of my favorite games growing up. It's interesting. The Incredible Machine was almost like the, the viral game of its time. Like Kerbal Space Program. It's just a sensation. But then, mm. the, all these years later, nobody talks about it. I mean, they kind of remember it, but it hasn't left. There aren't remakes. There aren't people calling for a remake. It's just the game's kind of forgotten. Yeah. Gary's Mod is kind of... I mean, I, I guess it was before you had the tools to do that kind of thing yourself. So, right. like, now people have tools to do physics sim and, like, you know, make goofy machines or whatever. Uh, you can do it in Blender or you can do it in... Gary's mod or whatever, you know, any game creation tool, basically. It's like, it's like a game, it's like a mini game development engine almost. Right. Well, for me, How about um, you? yeah, for me, uh, probably the big one that nobody talks about is Starflight. Now there's a lot wrong with the Starflight interface is this was a game that was made probably 87 or so and the, the sequel Starflight 2 was like 89-90 somewhere in there uh, the interface mm. was horrible just the whole experience of playing the game and not very great by today's standards but back then there was no precedent for how this should work and I was obsessed with the game and looking back at it now there's a lot that's mass effecty about it um, you are the commander of a spaceship you can land on planets you can get out, get out of the ship and drive around the the planet the surface of the planet in your space tank um, and you talk to aliens and the end is not an adventure to blow up the bad guy it's 
and it, it's a space mystery, like the best Star Treks, a space mystery. Mm -hmm. How, how do we stop this? Um, how do we stop this horrible doom? What's causing it? And you, yeah, it, it just, I loved it. It was great sci-fi. Um, and I wouldn't mind seeing that resurrected. Uh, another game, Star Wars Pit Droids, one of my favorite puzzle games ever, but it just doesn't run today. It just doesn't run today. You, when you installed the game, it's installed the QuickTime player because that's how it played the videos. This was one of the tie-in games for Phantom Menace. So that, that should date it pretty well. Yeah, it was like the, the pod racing thing, right? Except it wasn't no, a pod no. racing game. Right. It was uh, Star Wars Pit Droids. You were in charge of those pit droids that used to... What did they do? Watto had some of them. Like you push his nose and he folds up. Hmm. Yeah. And they, they're they sort of mindless. They just come out of their little bay and walk in a straight line. So you have to put all these guide arrows on the ground to guide them where they're going and you can't let them crash into each other and you have to guide them through some sort of obstacle course and you know puzzle game yeah that's kind of mm -hmm. like lemmings yeah yeah there's a lot it kind of like it's 2d you know overhead perspective with hexagon grid yes <gasps> Um, hexagons are the best of gons. <laughs> um, I'll run, uh, um, Catacomb 3D. This is, I have a whole list of here, but I'm not going to do them all. Catacomb 3D, it was made right around the time of Wolfenstein and used a very similar engine, except this one, you were like some sort of mage exploring you know catacombs and monsters would come out and you could blow up wall block you know you could blow up blocks to create openings for yourself mm. um, nobody talks about it or remembers it today like wolfenstein is remembered doom is remembered um rise of the triad is remembered but catacomb 3d is like nobody knew it existed also i had this vivid memory i looked it up and I have this memory tied from Catacomb 3D to the band PM Dawn, which was early 90s hip hop, kind of. It's, it's, it's another thing that is not remembered today. Lots of stuff from the early 90s is remembered. But for some <laughs> reason, I was really into this band. It was just two guys, one rapped and the other sang. And I was really into it, and I listened to that album endlessly on a loop while I played Catacomb. And those are not totally compa tonally compatible at all. Um, PM Dawn was like, their lyrics were like sappy teenage poetry. Like, imagine a 14-year-old girl that thinks she's in love for the first time. And what kind of poem she's going to write about it. And then some guy takes that um, <clears throat> poetry and turns it into a song. That's, <laughs> that's PM Dawn. And totally, totally incompatible with the mood of a game about shooting minotaurs in a, in a catacomb. I didn't know how to video game back then, I guess. Oh, man. Like, why was I listening to that? That's so not my taste today. It's weird thinking about what a different person I was in 1993. We've all left something behind. And Outcast, I'm not going to talk about that. I wrote a whole post about it years ago. I'll, I'll try to remember to link it in the show notes. Next one. Dear Diecast, Seamus mentioned that he likes the movement mechanics in the Spider-Man games, and I was wondering, Seamus... Have you ever played an older multiplayer game called Star Siege Tribes? 
it has a movement mechanic called skiing, where due to the way that the physics are programmed, you can gain a lot of momentum by repeatedly jumping while moving down a slope. Combined with the jetpack mechanics, skiing allows you to smoothly and swiftly traverse maps. It was such a big part of the experience that in Tribes 2, the developers made jumping the, by repeat. J jumping to be repeated by default in Tribes 1, you only jumped once per key press, and mentioned it in the tutorial. Veil, vale, Tim. I played Star Siege Tribes once. I don't know, maybe there was a demo or, you know, free access to it at some point. I remember it's a multiplayer game. Hmm. And my recollection is super vague. I mean, really, one session. Like, how did I even get access to it for once? I don't own it. It's not in my Steam library. So... I don't know what that maybe it was somebody at like maybe I was playing on somebody else's computer but I can't think of how that would happen but however it worked I played it once and I don't remember it hmm. I feel like I must have played tribes at some point but I never owned a copy and so it was always one of those things that I knew about but never got into and I think I got a free copy somewhere at some point and tried to like install it and they had some sort of I think that was tribes too I don't know. Also, your kid needs to quit smoking. I know, right? Dear Diecast, Hope you're doing well. I like to have very few games installed on my machine. In the past, I tried, tried to have at most three games installed at a time. That way, I could make sure the games I did have were ones I played regularly. But in recent years, the number of games I have installed has jumped up significantly. Right now, I've got no less than ten! 10 games on my system. So I wonder, how common is this? How many games do you have installed right now? Do you get the same or similar kind of anxiety like I described above? Keep being awesome, Lino. So you should go first, Paul. Okay, so I did a, a quick survey of my system, and this is this is just the computer that I, like, is my computer. Uh, the kids like are always installing games on other computers. I don't even know what's on those But the one that is like my computer and I install stuff on purpose. I have uh, 23 out of my 215 Steam games installed um, Six of my 15 GOG games four of my epic games out of 28 and then three games that don't even have a platform KSP RimWorld and my brother's experimental bullet hell game that he made in uh, in unity all right. I've got 12 games under Epic Games. I've got a, a smattering of like standalone indie stuff that, and my various Minecraft installs. That adds up to 21. Um, God Galaxies, I think only three games. Um, and, and then Steam. You, and, oh yeah, you got Origin or something, right? I've got Origin, but I can't see the number of games here right now. But then on Steam... <laughs> uh, Origin. On Steam, I've got 148 installed out of my 794 game collection. Oh, wow. Yeah. It gets out of hand quick, but you know... I never need know when I need to go back to a game for a few screenshots. You know, oh, I need a screenshot of this 2007 game for one image on an article. I don't want to sit there and wait for, you know, a 10 gigabyte download just to get this screenshot. Yikes. How big is your install drive? Oh yeah, I can cop. I can figure that out. I have one entire drive that is just games, and that drive is. Well, now I have to do math. That's no fair. Ugh. It's 1.8 terabytes in size, and I have 194 gigabytes free. I'll let somebody else do the math on that. 1.8 1.8 terabytes. Minus 194 gigabytes, basically two gigabytes. So that drive is pretty gigs. friggin' yeah, point two. Yeah, so you got like 1.6 gigs or terabytes of uh, of games installed right now. 
also, oh no, my, okay, here's a thing that's been happening, uh, unplanned topic. Unplanned topic, but this is another, like, that weird post I made a while ago about clocks breaking. This is another one yeah. of those inexplicable mysteries of life. I finally figured, okay, I was having this thing where every time I stood up from my computer, USB tr devices would randomly disconnect. Sometimes it was my keyboard, sometimes it was the mouse, sometimes it was my microphone, sometimes it was my um, projects drive, which is an external drive. Mm. And it was always random, just random. Oh, sometimes it was my secondary monitor. So it wasn't even just USB drives, just randomly some of the devices in the room would turn off and back on. So, you know, Windows would be like, doo-doo, doo-doo, doo-doo. <laughs> doo -doo, doo -doo. I'm like, right, what right. is that? Like home well, star just... runner. Right. And it happened every time I stood up from my computer. And finally I noticed, oh, I normally did that. I, I figured out it was static discharge. It coincides oh. with, with my, okay. When it happens on my feet, my feet will be just in front of like the wheels and it'll discharge into the base of my chair. But sometimes I've got my hands on the metal like armrests. And when that happens, the static just discharge hurts. So I noticed, started noticing that. And then I noticed I'd hear the little pop, you know, near my ankle, um, even though that didn't hurt, but I was discharging static into the wood floor I've got in here and somehow that caused all of this chaos. I worry I'm burning out my equipment and I have no idea how that's possible. Static is not that big of a charge. It should not be able to affect things that are all the way up on my desk. Wow. It's weird. I, I noticed that now because my project's drive is vanished <laughs> no. I, I just have to I don't want to touch it during the show but as soon as the show's over I'm gonna have to like unplug that use USB and plug it back in I, I really need oh, to man. figure out how I need to figure out how to fix this like I even put a humidifier in here thinking it was too dry and that hasn't helped and this wasn't happening like two months ago this is a recent development and nothing has changed. So there's another mystery to ponder of just the universe being exceptionally weird to me. I don't know what to say about that. Yeah, I don't know either. It's, USB is a little bit weird. Uh, I don't know if they fixed it, but it seemed like Windows had a bug where like USB ports would just like stop working over time. You had to eventually buy a new computer or reinstall Windows right. or something. Yeah. And I do have a lot of stuff plugged in via USB. I mean, I, I to solve this problem, I thought my old USB hub was dying. So I just like totally replaced my whole USB setup, b b bought this big fancy 12 plug USB port, and then it's still happening. But, but I'm not returning it because the new one lights up and is pretty fun dear diecast seamus and paul and ross in particular unity because it uses mono as one of its internal scripting engines exports c sharp assemblies that prove to be relatively easy to decompile and edit tools like dn spy make this trivial so long as you're comfortable with c sharp there's a whole bunch more to, he talks about uh how this is he's done some game modding and stuff to fix a game and at the end, he says, how often have you come across a game that you wanted to enjoy, but couldn't because it was some small problem with an obvious fix that you otherwise couldn't make because the internals of the game were locked away? Have you ever had to resort to modding to make a game playable? What's the furthest you've ever gone in order to make an overpowered game play on an underpowered computer? Sincerely, the listener previously, but let's also go with currently known as Brad. Thank you, Brad. For me... Uh, the game most in need of a little modding was Bully, because Bully did not have Invert Look on the PC mm. version. I 
think it must... I remember playing it through on the console and I was fine. And then I played it through on the PC and I couldn't find where to invert the controls. I was trying to play with the controller. And there was no invert anything anywhere that I could find. And so I was constantly like going crazy, looking the wrong way and making myself seasick. And I gave up. Nah. Um, almost every um, Bethesda game since Oblivion has needed mods to be playable for me to like fix the horrible interface or one of the <laughs> 10,000 just annoyances or time-wasting moments. So those are the, the big ones for me. Uh, it wasn't me personally who did the modding, but a friend of mine who was on the show some years ago modded KSP to add some functionality that was sorely missing. And uh, that was also written in uh, in Unity, and so you could decompile it into C-sharp. And I, I don't think they actually had, like, official modding support, or, or they like, they did their official modding support by just exposing a bunch of their classes in, like, this mod folder or something so you could just grab them but they didn't have them decompiled i i forget there was some sort of weird thing where you had to like manually decompile it into c sharp um but yeah unity is oh oh there was another one um planet by oscar stahlberg he's gone on to make a bunch of other stuff uh the most the most current one is um townscaper but he made this little toy where you could make a planet but there wasn't any made in unity but there wasn't any way to like save and load levels and so, same friend, not myself, went into the code, decompiled it, added the save feature, uh, and, like, recompiled it into a Unity game and actually sent it to Oscar and was like, hey, here's a version that has save and load. And uh, so I think that's the furthest, that's the closest I've gotten. I guess the closest I've gotten personally was when I was playing, um, what was that oh, platform? I'll, hang on, let me think of it. Drifter something. What is it? Uh, Hyper, Hyper Light Drifter? Yeah, Hyperlight Drifter. Um, in Hyperlight Drifter, there's a dash where you could like, if you hit the the dash key multiple times, you could do a multi dash. But you had it had this really tight timing where you had to hit it exactly at the right tempo. And so I made an auto hotkey script where I could just hold down the dash button and it would auto dash for me. <laughs> the 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 primitive form of modding. I've done that. If we're gonna include stuff like that, I've modded a roguelites that I, that I've roguelikes that I really enjoyed but that were just frustrating me or like I'd progress too slow or like you know you die and you had to play three hours of game over again to get back where you were and I said screw yeah, that yeah. and just you exit out to the menu and just make a copy of your save game folder and if you die just right. restore that copy <laughs> <laughs> like yeah, super, yeah. super like primitive modding, but it, it really works. Hi, Seamus, you mentioned a wish about remastering Thief Deadly Shadows. I have very good news for you. The mod called Thief DS Gold, which is part of a sneaky upgrade, is part of sneaky upgrade, a patch slash mod pack for Thief the Dark Shadow. This is the mod that stitches together levels and missions with no fog gates. That's amazing. That's quite a mod. That's quite, that's like art modding almost. Like that's, how'd you even do that? Oh well. So are there any other games that you wish were modded or remastered in a similar fashion? And since I'm talking Thief here, did you play any fan missions for Thief games? And ever tried the Dark mod? Best regards, Deadly Dark. P.S. Say hi to Paul. Hey Paul. Hi. Hi there. <clears throat> so, did I play any f Thief fan missions? And have I tried the Dark mod? I don't know if I... I know I tried it. I tried a few over the years. One of them... I... I got stuck. At the beginning, like you just sort of walk forward and you come to the very first building and it's this brightly lit entrance with guards outside. And I'm like, well, that can't be the way in. And I just go crawling all over the very small entryway and I couldn't find any other way in. 
and after like 15 <laughs> minutes, I'm like, well, I don't know what this mall, and you know, maybe I'm being a dumbass, and this is just, I'm missing some obvious alternate route, or maybe this modder is a dumb dumb that, you know, thinks the game should be about murdering guards on your way in. I don't know what to think here. You know, so I just gave up and quit. And uh, mm. I there was another one I played, and I don't remember what it was called. The I don't remember what the main character was named, but for some inexplicable reason, I remembered that the main character had a brother named Kadar. Why do I remember nothing but a character that doesn't even appear in the game? I guess I just liked the name <laughs> Kadar, or I thought it was funny. Someone, if you know what that mod was, please tell me in the comments. Oh boy. Um, games that I'd like to see, you know, modded or remastered. I, Silent Hill 2 and Star Wars Pit Droids. Silent Hill 2 you can't buy today, except, you know, collect, used copies for collector's prices. And it and the remake was an awful downgrade, and even that's out of print. So they just need to remaster that game. Um, you could, if you can get it, you can um, mod it into playability, but uh, I don't want to. I just want to install the game and enjoy it. And Star Wars Pit Droids, because you can't get it running today. I think the failing there is the QuickTime player which was originally, I think, targeted at Windows 98, doesn't do so good on a modern 64-bit machine. So you, I've, I've still got a physical copy, and I install it, and it goes through the initial thing, but when it would play the introduction movie, it just exits back to Windows. Aww. So those are the first two I thought of off the top of my head. Do you have anything you... Do you have any answers for any of these questions? No, I, I never really played the Thief games, um, and and I don't really care enough about old games, I guess. I don't know. I'm a bad gamer. Let's move to the next question. All right. Dear Diecast, I hope this finds you well. I love learning about old technology, and I just watched this cool five-minute documentary about Halcyon, a failed 1980s gaming console that was kind of like the progenitor of Amazon Alexa, and it made me wonder... Number one, since you were live back then, or at least Seamus was, do you remember seeing ads for it? And if so, what did you think of it at the time? I've never heard of this before in my life. And I was really interested in this topic. But I didn't get magazines and stuff. Like, for me, it was all folk knowledge. Other people talking about it. Or you go over to some kid's house and they would have different technology and that's how you learned about it. Or TV commercials. Other than that, I didn't... It didn't occur to me to, like, subscribe to a magazine to join my hobby. <laughs> Trade journal. <laughs> right? That's what I should have. I should have just started going to the trade shows at eight years old. Yeah. Uh, number two. In that same vein, has there ever been a piece of technology that you really liked but which never caught on? Um, I don't know if this really can, counts. But I liked the Intellivision. It was a really good gaming console. I think it was more interesting than the Atari 2600 by a long way. The games were more interesting. Um, but that machine isn't nearly as well remembered as Atari 2600. Mm. So it did catch on, but it's kind of been forgotten for whatever reason. What about the other way around? Was there ever a piece of tech where you thought, this will never get off the ground, and yet ended up being extremely popular? E.g., it was very skeptical about mobile gaming before I knew it, and they were bigger than PCs and consoles. Um, I, I had the same thing with mobile gaming. I completely, like, I thought, who's going to want to play a video game on a stupid phone? But keep in mind, I hardly ever use, I use my phone for phone calls. And occasionally my wife will send me a text message. So I am very much like, even though I'm super tapped into technology, I'm kind of 
a Luddite when it comes to smartphones. And also, I think the mobile gaming market is very different. There are a lot of people that play mobile games, but that's all they play. Like, they don't have... They are sort of checked out of the industry. They don't care. They don't know. They just look up highly rated things on the App Store and just try whatever. And they don't sure. follow publisher Waiting at the bus news. stop or something. Right. Yeah, they're not... I don't want to say they're not gamers, but they are not gamers in the same way that I am a gamer. They don't care about um, the AAA industry, about what the publishers are doing, about what the major licenses are doing, where the technology is going, who the big creative forces in the industry are and what they're up to these days. Um, and you know what's possible? What are we gonna get? VR is coming. Oh, look at the new ray trace thing. They're just they don't care. They just like you said, they want to kill some time at the bus stop. And I'm not looking down on that. It's just, it's it's a stretch to say we're part of the same hobby. I think they're part of a larger hobby. <laughs> mm. It's like some people are, some people are, you know, into building. You know, model cars, and some people are like Jay Leno, and collect actual cars. Is that the same hobby? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. You got a bunch of Matchbox cars on your wall in a glass case. It's kind of car collecting, right? Right, right. But they're very different from car collecting. I'd love to hear your thoughts about this. Keeping awesome, Leno. Okay, ah, way ahead we of you. I already answered. <laughs> Do you have anything to say about any of this? Uh, no, I'm I'm not quite old enough to have heard about the Halcyon. Um, I I was never really into like consoles or anything. I was always a, a PC guy because my dad had PCs for work, and then we would get his old ones, and so it was always just sure. like that's what we played on. And um, I've never really been into the into the tech space enough to to see like you know some piece of technology that was like oh that, that'll never work but it actually did i i guess i guess mobile gaming too probably just because i i never had a smartphone for years and years like i got my first smartphone maybe three years ago um right I remember when you visited me, and that was probably about three years ago, you had this tiny little non-smartphone. It was really cool looking. What was it? It was like a keychain size. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you buy it off of uh, off of the Chinese manufacturer or whatever. It's like a card phone or something. It's fascinating. It was really cool looking, but yeah, you're not going to be playing any Bejeweled on that. Yeah. And and once I did get a smartphone, I, I never really gamed on it. Like... I, I played around a little bit with the Steam Link. That was cool, but uh, you really need to have some sort of controller. Like, poking the screen is not the same experience as mouse and keyboard right. in any way. Yeah, I think that's my problem. I sit here at this desk all day. I've got my phone here, but why would I play with my phone when I'm sitting in front of a gaming computer? <laughs> Like, right, right. I do have uh, games on my phone, but they're not really games. One of the, It's like, just push your finger around the screen and it creates colorful clouds that, you know, float around according to physics. Like, that kind of thing. Mm. Like, it's not really a game. It's sort of like, I don't know, a little lava lamp sort of deal. And that's all I need. Like, five, that's enough to keep me interested for five minutes which is usually what I need when I'm like sitting in the waiting room to do something. All right. Dear Diecast, never playing an MMO game before. Oh, this, this is interesting. This is interesting. Somebody playing an MMO for the first time. Never playing an MMO game before. I decided to dip my toes into one. Star Wars The Old Republic. To my surprise, I even liked it fine. Still, a lot of things were completely new to me how the game handles its mechanics, world building, loot systems, social interactions, etc. It's all very illuminating to me. Now I understand where lies the birthplace of things I don't like in modern games. 
But what surprised me is that a lot of those things suddenly make sense in an MMO game while being unsuitable for single-player experience. The easiest and most obvious example for me was to use would be Dragon Age Inquisition. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Since, like the Old Republic, it was developed by Bioware. At the time of its premiere, a lot of people were saying that it's basically a single-player MMO, but for me it was simply a bad game. But playing an MMO game now, I have to agree with those statements. A lot of things that bothered me about Inquisition are the same ones that are being used, sometimes even successfully, in the Old Republic. Generally speaking, everything in Inquisition seems to be designed as if it really was an MMO. So I was wondering, why do, do so many games, I guess mostly computer RPGs, are fond of using these mechanics? I'd like to ask you to use your six psychic powers to read designers' minds and grant me with that knowledge. Live long and prosper in the Force. <laughs> Harry. <laughs> Derek. Um, speaking of Bioware, apparently Anthem was cancelled. Any comments on that? The funny thing about it is you hear that Anthem was cancelled and everybody's reaction is like, wait, wait, it was still running? <laughs> like, this is a very strange time to cancel Anthem. It would have made sense to cancel it six months ago. Okay, here's the thing. You should either spend more money in, on it and make it a better game, or just cut it off. But running it for a long time and not improving it struck me as being a weird decision. I guess they were just going to run it until it, it no longer made enough to support itself. Like, they just waited until the income from the, the in-game you know, store, made less than the server costs. That's my guess. Yeah. Some pumps couldn't keep up with the leaking water coming in through the hull, so they're just like, well, abandoned ship, we're done. <laughs> yep, put a hole in it, send it to the bottom of the ocean, walk off, shrug, and like, who knew this wouldn't work? I, it's just, this is such a capricious industry. You certainly, <laughs> it's just random. You can't blame anybody for this, especially not us in management. Yeah, I mean, look at Star Citizen. They're still making money. Right, there's just no way to tell what'll make money and won't, what won't. Um, so and I think why... that comes back to the answer to this question about the MMO is the main one. Um, I don't know, Derek, how long you've been around in games, but there's this game called World of Warcraft, and everybody wanted to make World of Warcraft money. So they just did everything that World of Warcraft did all the time. I think it's more than... I think everybody just fell in love with that game and thought of all the fun they had with it and have tried to put those mechanics when they became finally, you know, decade later, they're all grown up and now they're a game designer and they decide, well, I like these mechanics. Let these, let's put these in the game. So... And I can even understand that. If you gave me some game franchise, I'd try and turn it into a Bioware-style, you know, story-driven thing. Because that's where my passion is. With a bunch is. of Minecraft mechanics. <laughs> right. Yeah, no matter what you give me. It's like, I'd want to lean as far towards a Mass Effect KOTOR type thing. Dragon Age, you know, you get the idea. Yeah, yeah. And so if you put me in charge of designing a game, and let's say you put me in charge of, you know, an Ubisoft game, well, each iteration, I'm just going to take another half step forward towards the kind of game I actually like. And I'm going to keep doing that and going that direction until somebody forbids me from doing it anymore. <laughs> so t somebody tells me to stop. Because that's what I want to do. So that's my take on why those mechanics show up in other games. Is you know these people fell in love with it. Jeez, almost twenty years ago, fifteen years ago, more like seventeen. It's a it, it's a long time. Yeah. Hey, Seamus, you mentioned that you really like Tinker's mod for Minecraft, and that's okay, why you're I, not using one point sixteen yet. I can I can sum this one up. 
In the past, I've said I like using Tinker's Construct, a Minecraft mod that lets you build your own tools. And yeah, it's not available in newer versions of Minecraft. And they're like, have you heard of this? And what do you think? Oh, and this was from Tim. Veil Tim. There are some who call him Tim. So the, <laughs> the answer to this is that I did try Tetra. But Tetra, back when I checked it out, probably a year and a half ago, um, it it's a you build your own tools. You build the head, you build the shaft. It, it works a little different than Tinkers, but it the same idea. You build your your tool or weapon a component at a time. Mm. But to get to the highest, or really to get to the halfway, there's sort of a roadblock in the middle of your progression. And to get that over that roadblock, you have to explore this particular type of newly generated dungeon that appears randomly around the world. Now, I hate this. I don't <laughs> mind if you add like a new mineral to go after or a new ore to go after that I can dig up. That's playing Minecraft, but hunting, and I was going crazy. I played for hours and hours and hours and hours, and I was like, how do you find these places? And I really was enjoying the mod, so I just kept searching and searching. And then finally, after all these hours, I, I gave up and turned on creative mode and no-clip mode, so I could sail right through mountains and look for these dungeons without having to just, you know, dig for them. Mm. And I went, I just, full speed, like flying speed, went along and I spent another 45 minutes looking for this dungeon. What? And then I asked the developer and he was like, oh, you're on Minecraft you know, whatever version, 1.5, or I, I forget what version it was, 1.4 or something. You're on 1.4, yeah, the, the, the generation, the dungeons don't get generated on that version. You have to be on 1.6. <laughs> oh, no. Thanks for fucking telling me before I wasted all those hours of my life. And, you know, why don't you do, can you imagine if everybody felt the need to add a new kind of dungeon with every damn mod like that mixes poorly with other mods because there are other mods that change world gen like oh bigger hills or zones are bigger or more realistic more types of biomes there's a lot of proc gen stuff that would supersede your dungeon and then the dungeons won't appear like don't mix mod types like that and there's already yeah. a mechanism for for doing this which is you add the rare item that the player wants to one of the drop lists so i might find it in mines or if you want it to be harder to get you'd have to go to the nether and find a stronghold or whatever and put it in those chests there are all sorts of ways to do this but adding a dungeon that doesn't work sometimes and not telling it the user never generates. Oh, and I was so mad and that left such a bad taste in my mouth that I've never come back to it. I'm sure I could find a version that works, but I'm just like, no, I'm angry. Yeah, it's, it's like DRM, except that you don't know if the game is even running or not. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. No, oh. We're out of emails. We've done it. Somehow. In inexplicably. Is this the most emails we've ever covered in a single episode? It sure feels that way. Well, high five, everybody. Um, Al, when, when you do that, actually <laughs> give yourself a high five and, and don't slap yourself. Um, yeah, so that's a show. We did it. We're back. We emptied the dot in the mailbag. You guys got to give us some more. It looked crazy because I was just letting them pile up on my week off and when Ross was a guest and they piled up quite a bit. It got out of control. Like my my 
Gmail is m much less full. <laughs> it's kind of funny. It's like it felt like a whole screen worth of them. All right, well, the mailbag is now empty. So if you've got a question for us, now's the time. The email is diecast at shamusyoung.com. Send us your, an your questions and we'll give you dumb answers. Video game related questions, please. Please. Um, yeah. So that's the show. Say goodbye, Paul. Goodbye, Paul. Wait, 